Hello and welcome to the Institute of Managers and Leaders Australia and New Zealand. My name is Sam Bell, I'm the Chief Executive Officer, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our third session today for our first development day of 2023 titled Positive Politics in the Workplace. And we've got no other than our pinch hitter uh, to finish today's development day, but Jackie Perkins. And I'll introduce Jackie uh, shortly. But just before we start, um, I think today's session has been a really, really positive uh, experience. Um, the feedback we've got from all of you today has been overwhelmingly positive. And it's clear that the topic managing up and across has really hit the mark um, for so many people. And of course, as we talked about at the outset, you know, I personally believe that managing up and across, particularly for middle managers, um, is, is a really critical skill for both effectiveness and success in the workplace um, for managers and leaders. So it's been wonderful to get that reassuring feedback. And I've got no doubt that our third session today will be exactly the same. Um, we encourage the interaction through the chat, um, through the questions. So please, if you've got a burning question to ask Jackie, when it pops up, please put that into the chat, uh, into the uh, question box. And of course, we'll get to those Q&A at the end, um, but also engage on the chat as well. I know Jackie will um, bring about that interactive, um, which is what we do as an institute. We really thrive on the practicality of our learning and development. Um, and our facilitators like Jackie thrive on you know, being interactive and being engaging. And, and so it's certainly a key part of our, um, our learning philosophy as an institute. And for, for 82 years, since 1941, the institute has been um, creating better managers and leaders. And it's the learning and the content that Jackie will talk about today that's come out of our short courses, it's come out of our leadership programs, like our Management Essentials, which is our two-day leadership program, our foundations, which is our sixth day, and of course, our accelerate program for middle to senior leaders. Um, all of these are designed for behavioral change um, and to drive outcomes for you and your, and your employer. Um, and of course, today is a taster of that. And I know Jackie will always bring her best to the table um, mm -hmm. when it comes to development day. And um, today's session, positive politics in the workplace, um, you know, politics often gets a bad rap, um, but ultimately most organisations are political entities and we all need a level of smarts to navigate this landscape. It's hard to influence or affect change unless you have allies and support at varying levels within your organisation. Although net networking is consistently flagged as one of the top competencies that successful leaders need, the art of internal networking is less understood and often poorly navigated. So in this session today with Jackie, our third session for today's development day, we'll explore the following out learning outcomes for you. Firstly, how to make internal networking purposeful and courageous. Secondly, defining and exploring three key internal networks, operational, professional, and strategic. And lastly, personal development steps to help you, to make you a better networker. So I'm really looking forward to this session. As with all our other sessions, your action plans, please have those at the ready. This is so important for us as an institute that today's session is not just listen, but it's also learning. It's also putting down the steps that you're going to take uh, and absorb Jackie's learning and her content today to take back into the workplace and create some behavioural change for both yourself and across your organisation and the people that you lead. So keep those action plans at the ready. Um, and. Uh, Listen to, to the wonderful uh, content that Jackie's got. She always brings her best. And um, I'm sure many of you, both our professional members and our corporate members and, and corporate clients uh, here today know Jackie Perkins as a highly skilled facilitator, speaker and coach. Um, she's got many years of leadership experience within the corporate world and training uh, corporate leaders. Jackie's ability to connect and establish genuine relationships with personnel of the company she represents and the participants of her programs, including all of the IML leadership programs, have won her high praise, appreciation and industry awards. Jackie delivers engaging and entertaining programs and, uh, and uses a combination of highly interactive videos, practical coaching assignments and customised leadership resources. Her colourful and lively style, her commitment to being with you all the way and determination to keep it real guarantee a memorable and transformational experience. Jackie Perkins, <laughs> over to you. 
and thank I'm looking you. forward to the session. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. And yeah, I just want to reiterate what Sam said because we've got the Foundations of Intentional Leadership Program and I'm just busy running the public uh, version of that in Brisbane and that topic of managing upwards keeps coming up even though it's not in the content we always make time to talk about it because it's such a huge part of people's leadership journey and then I've just finished doing the middle leaders at Endeavor uh, doing a whole leadership program through IML with them and that also the topic of managing up uh, came up again and again and how to communicate with your your manager and get the best out of them so it is, it is a topical topic, but we are going to be talking about positive politics in the workplace. And so I'm going to ask you, I've got a statement up there that says it's not power that corrupts, it's powerlessness that corrupts. Excuse me, I've just got an itchy eye. Um, so that actually I've stolen from a video, a Harvard Business Review video uh, called How Best to Play Office Politics, which will be made available to you as part of the resources. And uh, that was one of the little quotes that I stole from it. It's not power that corrupts. It is powerlessness that corrupts. If you would like to go to the chat box and actually just put, what does that mean to you? If you're in an organization, what do we mean by that? It's not power that corrupts. It is powerlessness that corrupts. If you'd like to just put your thoughts on what that actually means to you personally or within your organization, that would be great. And it will just set the tone, set the scene for what we're going to talk about today. So isn't this two sides of the same coin? Yeah, maybe. Harley, thank you. Yes, maybe. Um, let's, let's have a conversation about that. When people feel powerless, um, uh, I'm just can be disruptive. Yes, good inability to influence. Love that. Love that. If people don't feel as though they have um, the the whole picture, let me just make this a little bit bigger so I can see there. Uh, effective decision making. Good. If people don't feel as though they have a say or that people are listening, they will not feel engaged. Good. Love that. Um, people can feel negative and demotivated if they don't feel they have any power. Um, where there's power imbalance, um, there's an opportunity to take advantage of others. Okay, okay. All right, good. Thank you. Thank you for your great interaction there. What I took away when I watched the video was that if I, as a middle leader or even as a senior leader or a frontline leader, want to effect a change, imp uh, want to influence an outcome. I want to suggest a different project that we work on, or I've got an idea on how we could be more efficient or effective, or I want to suggest some changes to team structure or to certain products that we produce or whatever it might be, that if I'm a little lone wolf, uh, if I'm not the CEO or the CFO, and I'm just this little lone wolf, if I don't have allies with influence, if I don't have allies with authority, if I don't have allies with credibility and clout on my side working with me, it's going to make it extremely difficult to affect any change or to introduce anything that I would like to introduce. So as Sam said, organizations are essentially political entities. And again, that is something that I, I took out of the little Harvard Business Review uh, video that we're sending to as part of the resources. And also as part of your resources, we've sent you an article that talks about this particular model, the four metaphors of organizational politics. And it says there, to have influence, you need to understand the terrain. So what do we mean by that? So I'm just going to read from that article, which we will make available to you. It says, defining politics, organizational politics refers to a variety of activities associated with the use of influence tactics to improve personal or organizational interests. Studies show that individuals with political skills tend to do better in gaining more personal power as well, as well as managing stress and job demands than their politically naive counterparts. They also have a greater impact on organizational outcomes. 
So a pretty powerful statement, and I suppose it's what lens you're looking through when we use the word political, whether we see it as something productive and positive, or whether we see it as something negative. So if we just map out those, those four quadrants there, you'll see that on the uh, horizontal axis is whether our source of power is informal, which they have referred to as soft, or whether it's more formal where we have the title to go with it. And then up the vertical axis is the level in the organization. So um, these two, um, the, it's, the weeds is me operating on an individual level with either soft power or formal power. The woods would be at an organizational uh, level operating um, with soft power or working at an organizational level with, with formal power. So what does that actually mean? So if I'm down here, if I'm down here in the weeds, what is an example of that? So this is where it's me as an individual actually decides to start creating internal networks and building relationships on an informal basis and on an individual basis. So I'm actually just going to share a real life example that happened yesterday. I was busy working with Endeavor a Foundation that provides services to people with disabilities. And we were talking about networking and I gave it to them as a post-workshop uh, assignment to go and complete and build their internal networks. And one of the participants said to me, oh my goodness, Jackie, this stuff works. It was absolutely amazing. She said, I have been deliberately building my relationships with two key people in the finance department. I've actively sought them out, gone and had lunch, had a coffee with them, gone to the coffee room, chatted specifically to them about projects I'm working on, asking them about what they're working on. And she said, I had to put in a business case to try and get sufficient and additional funding for a project that she wants to launch. And she said, you'll never guess what, the one particular person from the financial department came to her and said, Beck, actually, I've put your business case to the top of the pile and you're going to be getting the funding that you need. So on an individual level, at a very informal level, that internal networking can be really powerful. Now, if we go to the rocks, this is still on an individual level, but this is where I've got authority and I've got the role to back it up. So I might, able, I might be able to actually access resources and make decisions simply because I have the authority to do it. But do I necessarily get the support and the backup that I need from a personal commitment perspective. So I love this little mantra and I often refer to it, a man persuaded against his will is of the same opinion still. So a man persuaded against his will is of the same opinion still. So I might have the authority to make a decision, but if I haven't built relationships and allies and a really good internal network, I might not have the support for the suggestion that I'm now authorizing to have implemented. And when I then go to the woods, um, the woods is where it's at an organizational level, but it's actually soft, soft power. So this is where we have hidden assumptions. This is where we have unspoken routines. This is where almost culture seems to sit, where we've worked out a way of what we enjoy, don't enjoy, what we do, what we don't do. It's very informal, but it's on an organizational level. But the high ground is where we actually have the authority, plus we have the whole organization behind us. So um, this, this is the high ground, and this is where we can really put in those strict organizational systems and rules and structures and policy guidelines. So it's obviously that's, you know, the easiest place to influence there. So having looked at that, I want us just to reflect on the fact that networking is often listed as one of the top 10 leadership competencies. And I know whenever I run a leadership program and I've said to people, you know, how important is networking to you as a leader? People have gone, oh, well, it's a cherry on the top. I know it's something I should do, but, uh, you know, if I've got time or it's not something I really want to do, but yeah, I can see it might be useful. But very seldom do I get an emphatic yes, absolutely essential to my development and to my success that I build my networking skills. So what is networking? If you want to put 
Uh, and I'm going to suggest we have internal networking and external networking. I'm also going to suggest we have proactive networking and reactive networking. If you want to just put your idea of what networking is in the chat, that would be great. So whether it's a proactive networking example or internal or external or reactive, uh, just pop it into the chat box and let's have a look and see what you're saying. Building relationships, great. Professional connection, love that. Collaboration, love it. Creating a tribe of close collaborators, beautiful. Love that, really love that. Anything else? Building relationships with others that allows for help and support going both ways. I'm glad you said both ways. Uh, making connection and trusted relationships with like-minded collaborators, help out when needed, good. Interacting, offering something more than taking, well done. I'm really glad you said that, Dr. Christian Williams, giving more, take, giving more than what you're going to take. Um, an environment you can interact with, beautiful. Alrighty, so I'm just going to jump out of there for now. Some really, really good suggestions. Thank you. So I'm going to quote from Devorah Zak. We all know networking is uh, its not about what you know, it's about who you know, but Devorah Zak takes it one step further. She says, it's not what you know, it's not even who you know, it's who knows you. So now I'm about to embarrass my eldest son by talking about him on a public forum and uh say that my eldest son would absolutely love to have a girlfriend, but will not go on any dating apps, will not go out there and put himself out there. And I've said to him, you know, like, you don't have a GPS tracking system where people can go, oh, there is this good looking, beautiful man who's a chartered accountant living at 17 Wentworth Drive, who is kind and a wonderful Christian and would treat women beautifully. That just doesn't exist. So unless you get out there and start telling people about yourself, they don't know who you are. They don't know what you have. They don't know what you have to offer. So how can they even connect with you? Because they don't even know you exist. Now, what does this mean to us in a organization or even just in a professional environment? Not everybody knows what our skill set is. Not everybody knows what our knowledge is, whether it's within your sector or within your organization. So how can people tap you on the shoulder and say, I've got a great project I'd like you to work on, or there's a secondment that I think you would love, or I'd really love to invite you to this seminar that we're having overseas because I can see it's just up your alley. If I don't even know who you are and what you do and what your skills and knowledge are, I can't even start to think about how I could possibly build that relationship with you. So we need to be purposeful and courageous. So if you'd like to pop into the chat box, what do I mean by that? It's purposeful and it's courageous. So what do we mean by that? Pop it into the chat box. So if we network, we have to make sure it is purposeful and courageous. What do we mean by that? So someone has written referrals. Stepping out of your comfort zone, good. Get outside your comfort zone. Be intentional, good. Be proactive, good. Purposeful, you should have an objective for the other side, yes. Clearly defined intent, great. To find outcome, being vulnerable, accepting criticism, beautiful, being strategic, well done, for who, what, and when, brilliant. Talking to people different to yourself, well done, taking the initiative to connect, well done, excellent, all right, you're all, you're all on it, accepting rejection, thank you, and failure, yes, courageous, not limiting your own thinking, well done, thank you. Now, because I'm a South African, I'm going to give you a South African example, Networking is not taking an AK-47 and just going, whoever's in my line of sight. It's actually taking that rifle and it's thinking very clearly, who do I need to be connecting with and going, Pah. so line of sight, who needs to be in my network? You need to have an outcome that you're looking for, a goal that you're working towards. And then to do that, you need to be courageous. So I'm going to suggest and not many of us wake up in the morning and go, 
oh, I just can't wait to go phone some people that I've never met in my life and introduce myself. Oh, I can't wait to get to this function tonight and introduce myself to five people I've never met and start a conversation. Not many of us are wired that way. So I am going to have to be courageous. It is going to feel clunky. I am going to feel awkward and stupid. And if you feel awkward and if you feel clunky, pat yourself on the back because it means you're doing something different. If we keep on doing the same thing over and over again, we're going to get the same result. So we're doing something different and it feels awkward until it becomes second nature. So I'm going to suggest, and again, I've stolen this from one of the little resources we're going to send you, that we have three uh, categories of networks. And I just found this really helpful, not to just think about this broad amorphous mass out there that I need to connect with, but really being quite intentional about who needs to be in my network. Now, this is looking internally and externally. So if we just look at the operational network, um, anyone want to just have a guess at this? What, what does an operational network mean? What kind of people would be in an operational network? Just uh, whack your answers into the chat box. What kind of people would be in your operational network? People you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, stakeholders, those that help you achieve work goals. Good, 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 Sue. Thank you. Colleagues, trusted advisors, teammates. Yes, good. Okay, I'm going to suggest to you that your operational network, and one of you already said that, I think it was Sue, is Anyone that helps you to deliver on your KPIs and your goals for your job. What are you being paid to do? And who do you need to get that job done? So I'm going to use an example as me contracting to the Institute of Managers and Leaders. And in any one day, the Institute of Managers and Leaders could have several facilitators in any one of the states in Australia or in New Zealand. Now, if you happen to walk into that workshop and for whatever reason, the diagnostic tools for DISC or Genos Emotional Intelligence have not arrived, or God forbid, forbid the materials and the workbooks haven't arrived, you now jump on your phone and you're now phoning delivery in uh, Sydney or Brisbane saying the diagnostic tools haven't arrived or the workbooks haven't arrived. And when they see your number come up, you don't want them to go, oh, my God, there's Jackie. She's such a pain in the butt. She can just wait. I've got 10 facilitators phoning me that I need to help. I want them, when they see my name come up and my number come up, oh, that's Jackie. I need to help her. So that could be anyone from IT. It could be anyone from marketing. It could be anyone from de um, developing product. It could be people de you know, curating courseware. It could be anyone that's actually running the administrative side of things. I need to know that anyone I rely on to deliver that workshop is on my side, is in my corner, is going to help me to the best of their ability to make sure that I'm delivering a great experience for our customers. So I want you to think, do you know the key people in your HR department? Most importantly, do you have IT in your back pocket? They are so important. Do you have people in payroll? Do you have people in finance? Do you have people in marketing? Who do you need in your corner that's going to go above and beyond to help you? Not because you're beautiful and good looking and rich, but because you're a pleasure to work with because you help them. If they ask you for something, you give it, you do it. They ask you to do something, you say when and how hard. So you make their life easy and they in return make your life easy so that you're this really nice, smooth, oiled machine to create great customer experiences regardless of whatever role you're in. Okay, our professional development network. So stealing from the video, it's not what you know, it's who you know that gets to determine what you know. So what you know is determined by who you know because they determine what you get to work on, which is what you're going to develop in terms of your knowledge and skills. So who do I need to be connecting with that would give me an opportunity on that project? 
Who do I need to be talking to that would give me an opportunity to have a secondment? Who do I need to be talking to that would pave the way for me to go on that seminar or study further? So who needs to be in my professional development? So we're looking specifically who, and we want to think, well, how am I going to connect with them? Do I ask them to do, be my mentor? Do I start contributing to forums on LinkedIn that they're part of? How am I going to go about that? Am I going to suggest that I come and have a coffee with them one day and they share with me what they're working on and I'm happy to share what I'm working on? How am I going to develop it and giving myself some timeline so it's not just on the never ever? And then our final one is our strategic network. So this would be more external now. It could be a senior exec, but I also want you to be thinking externally. If you want to have a go, just jump onto the chat box. What kind of people do you think would be in your strategic network? What kind of people would be in my strategic network? Similar industry users. Beautiful. Well done. Yes. Specialists, well done. Subject matter experts, yes. Maybe ex-colleagues, good. Mentors, influencers, thought leaders, policy makers, brilliant. Potential clients, good. Um, people at an organization you aspire to work for, really nice. Um, uh, forgive me, KOL standing for what? Coles within the industry. Um, if you can just spell that out for me. Internal customers, teams, good. Coaches. So, Reeves, if you want to just type in KOL for me. Oh, key opinion leaders. Beautiful. Thank you. I've learned something today. Thank you. Good. All right. So, I'm going to suggest uh, the people in your strategic network are going to help you to be aware of opportunities that are coming your way in terms of the sector you're in, in terms of the market that you're in. Um, it's also people that are going to make you aware of the threats that are coming your way. So if we think about software developers at the moment, I've got a, a team of software developers that are talking about artificial intelligence and going, well, you know, is this a threat to our sector? Is this a threat to our business? So, you know, the more people I can talk to in software development that are identifying opportunities to leverage of AI or how to mitigate against the threat of AI, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel again and again and again. You've got key people out there that have already thought of these threats and have put steps in place or are seeing opportunities that they're leveraging off. And so you start to work together to make your sector better. So I've got a little word that's called competitor. We collaborate and we compete. So we're in the same sector and we're selling against each other, but we're also collaborating because we're sharing ideas to make the sector better. So I do a lot of work in aged care and retirement. And I say, you know, when I share with you uh, something that we're doing in your particular business, I'm quite comfortable to share it with another retirement or aged care company because it's not about secret squirrel business. It's about making the sector better. It's about making sure we all are providing a better experience for people in retirement and aged care and doing it better. All righty. So now finally, or not finally, I'm jumping the gun there. I want us to think about the networking ladder of loyalty. So you may or may not have come across the phrase of the uh, seven to 14 touch points. So in order to convert a stranger into an advocate, we would have seven to 14 touch points. So my little analogy is, let's say your very first job was to go sell hot dogs at the MCG stadium. My question to you is have a think about it and put it in the chat box. You've got your tray of hot dogs. Would you sell more hot dogs if you walked around the stadium once and gave 100,000 people one opportunity to buy a hot dog? Or would you sell more hot dogs if you just chose an aisle of 10,000 people and walked up and down that same aisle of 10,000 people 10 times? So option one, you walk around the stadium once and give 100,000 people one opportunity to buy. Or you choose an aisle of 10,000, this is option two, and go up and down it 10 times. Which one is going to get me more hot dog selling? Yes, two, 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 same place more often. Good, well done, well done, well done, exactly. So as I walk down the aisle, someone grabs their wallet. Next time, the person next to them goes, oh, that smells good. 
Next time they're going, oh, my child won, won, wants one now. Next time, oh, that was so good. I want another one. And so it goes. Now, this is exactly the same with the networking ladder of loyalty is we might in that first instance just be creating awareness of myself and what I do and my knowledge and my skills. The next time I interact with you, whether it's face-to-face -face or on LinkedIn or at a conference or, uh, or, or having a coffee, you start to seriously consider it. And then the next time we get together again, whether it's virtual or face-to-face, -face, I make a decision. Yes, this, you know, Jackie's got some great knowledge. She's got some great skills. I'd like to actually continue working with her. Action, I'm going to actually invite her to the next meeting that we have so she can share her thoughts with my team. And there on, I'm now really have bought into Jackie and I'm completely loyal to her and I back her and I support her and I love her ideas. And even more than that, I'm actually going to tell everybody else within the organization or the sector that you really need to get Jackie onto this because she knows what she's doing. So always thinking that it's not an immediate, you know, someone put rejection, that we have to be good with rejection. If someone rejects us first time, it doesn't matter. Remember, you've got those seven to 14 touch points. It's the courage to go back again and again and again. So I have a little saying that everyone is selling something to someone. Everyone is selling something to someone. Whether you're selling a project to your, uh, to your team, whether you're selling an idea to your manager, whether you're selling a product or a service to your customer, or whether you're simply selling to your two-year-old that is a really good idea to brush their teeth, every single one of us is selling something to someone. So there's this weird concept that only people in sales sell, no. Every single person is in the business of client acquisition and client retention. And internally, that means we're also selling our, our ideas, our knowledge to people to create better experiences, better outcomes. So what do we need to be aware of? The elevator pitch, we're all very aware of the elevator pitch. If I get into the elevator on, on ground zero and I go up to level 30 and I'm in the same elevator as Richard Branson, which actually did happen to me once in Johannesburg. We can either sit and stare or stand and stare at the numbers and say, oh, it's a bit hot today. Yes, yeah, really humid. Yes, yeah, and all this rubbish. And we get out of the elevator and we've just wasted 30 seconds with one of the most influential people in the world where we could have actually exchanged something of real currency where I could have walked away better off for it and he could have walked away better off for it. So we always want to be thinking, when we put our little elevator pictures together, I want you to imagine that that person is standing there with two speech bubbles coming out of their ears. The one speech bubble is going, so what? So if you're doing an elevator pitch like, oh my goodness, you should work with me. I'm so knowledgeable. I'm so intelligent. I've got an MBA. Oh, I always make my sales targets. Your little speech bubble is going to go, so what, so what, so what? I do not need to hear this. You're wasting my time. But if I talk to you about what I could do for you, how you could benefit by working with me, what I know that could actually help you solve a problem, your little speech bubble is going to go, oh, Tell me more. So what do you want in that little elevator pitch that's going to make the person stop and go, ah, oh, you've got my attention. Tell me more. It could be your CEO. It could be your CFO. It could be your IT manager. I like what you're saying, Sam. Tell me more. So there is actually a science behind this. So I'm going to actually give you a little a script a framework for a script based on the science of how we actually process information. So you'll see there on the screen, you've got four steps and they are very strategically chosen in the order and the way to create optimum uh, reason for the person to engage with you. So when I introduce myself, I'm not going to say, you know, I'm the CFO of this organization, or I'm the head of uh, HR, or I'm head of sales, because your role means nothing. That title could have very different implications in different sectors, different markets. It also puts you into a kind of ranking where the person might go, oh, you're too high up there for me, so there's no point in me listening to you. Or actually, you look like you're a little bit sort of low down there in pedestrian, I'm not sure I can be bothered with people like you. So we want to talk about what can, what do I actually do? What do I actually do? 
So I'm actually going to give an example. I said to you, I work a lot in the aged care and retirement space. I'm going to actually talk about the fact that I, as a uh, consultant for this uh, aged care company, that's trying to pioneer a whole new way of offering um, aged care solutions to our retiring population. And I'm trying to get into uh, hospitals and talk to the social workers and get them to understand that when they refer their patients who have gone into hospital and are not allowed to go home unless they are able to transfer to an aged care facility, I want to convince them that I actually have a new pioneering option for them that doesn't fall under the traditional aged care model. Now, this social worker is a bit nervous to do that because it's not tried and tested, and I'm trying to break ground with them. So I would go to that social worker and say, every single day, I am working with people such as your patients who are not able to go home from hospital because they do not have an alternative place to go. And I help people such as yourself find the exact right place where you can transfer them with confidence, knowing there's going to be no bounce back into hospital, which is what they dread. Um, I've done this for a number of people uh, that are in this particular vicinity, and I can actually name some of the social workers I'm working with that would be happy to be a testimony to you that were able to deliver on this. So one of the things that we're able to do is once your particular patient transfers to us, they never have to move again. We have an aging in place continuum of care philosophy and they will never ever have to move again. So I would love to actually chat to you a little bit more about that. What day next week would work for you so I can talk you through our model. So what you've done is because we process everything through our emotional brain first, our emotional brain is immediately going to go, is this helpful to me or is this harmful to me? So is this going to help me or is this going to waste my time? So I want to talk about how I can help you and how I've helped people like you right up front in the beginning of that conversation. So the person goes, yes, this sounds interesting. Tell me more. But if I start off with, oh, you know, this is what I do and I've got all these credentials and I'm so successful, the little so what bubble is going to come up and they're going to go threat. Waste of time, don't want to engage in this conversation. So to pull all of this together, we really want to, if we go back to those three networks, operational, strategic, and professional development, we want to do our research and preparation. Who do I need in each of those networks? How am I going to actually contact them? When am I going to do it? Then we need to create an individual script for each of those particular people because they're all going to have different WIFM factors. What's in it for me? So I have to think about the WIFM factor for every person I'm going to talk to. And I have to make sure that early in the piece when I'm talking to them or in the email, I'm smacking that WIFM factor on how I can help them or how I've helped people like them. And then I need to document it because I need to remember Going back to my networking lo loyalty ladder, I need to know which stage of the ladder they're at so that I know what my next step is to finally get them to the point of being an advocate. So you have been given that as part of your action plan, and I'm really going to encourage you to complete that. Now, we did talk about the fact that we wanted to focus on internal networking. So I want to talk to you about something that I call having your little gold nuggets. So if you happen to be sitting around the water cooler or you happen to go into the kitchen where everyone's getting coffee or if you're lucky enough to have a canteen at your work or you go there and your CEO is there or your CFO is there or the head of product and development is there, someone you really want to talk to, that we do not waste time with, hey, how are you? Oh, how's your hubby? How's your wife? How are the kids? What was your weekend like? Blah, blah, blah. Waste of time. We've just wasted a golden one or two minutes with someone who's very time poor, who we need to help us to get something over the line that would be critical to my team, but also critical to the business. 
So we want to be thinking about those little gold nuggets. What can it do up your sleeve that if you bump into the CFO, what does he want to hear? What's important to him? If I bump into the head of HR, what do they want to hear? If I bump into the CEO, what does she want to hear? What, what is important to her? So I'm going to give you a really good example. I used to do quite a bit of work for the Australian Institute of Management. And um, I would be sent to run a variety of different programs. But one of the programs that I really, really loved was presentation skills. And I very seldom got chose to do that. And I really wanted more of that work. So as I was going up the stairs, the CEO was walking down and she went, oh, hey, Jackie, how are you? This is what I'm going to suggest you do. I'm great. Thank you, Vivian. Oh, you know what I'd like to tell you? I've just actually come from this organization up the road that needed help with presentation skills because they're doing presentations to shareholders and they have great financial information, but they're not really good with their presentation skills. We've had the most awesome experience. I would really love to show you some of the video footage I took. I'm blown away by the results. From then on, I suddenly had a reputation for running really great presentation skills. And all it had taken was that little 60-second gold nugget with the CEO on the stairways as we were passing. So have a think when someone says, hey, Scott, how are you? I'm great, thanks, Jackie. Oh, you know what I've just uh, come across? You know what I'm working on? You know what my team is really interested in? I think you'd really love to hear this. Have that little gold nugget so you can use that time at the water cooler really succinctly to your benefit and, of course, to their benefit as well. So we've covered off a hell of a lot of stuff very, very quickly. I'm going to ask you to do something for me and just put your three main takeaways, your three main insights, your three little gold nuggets that you got into the chat box. And um, then Sam is going to come wrap up for us. And if you've got any specific questions, at that point, we'll ask you to put your questions into the Q&A box. But for now, uh, just pop up. What are your three main takeaways that you're going to take away and intentionally put into place? If you can start doing that. And we'll get Sam to come do a wrap up. And then we will ask you to put any questions, if you've got any questions, in, in the Q&A box. Okay, Sam, over to you. Thank you very much, Jackie. What a terrific presentation. Once again, you've hit it out of the park as usual, Jackie, um, with session three. There's a lot of um, things coming through. Um, don't keep your wins to yourself. I think I think you're quite passionate about that one, Jackie. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, planning for specific people when networking, be courageous in networking. It's who you know. Forget the chit-chat. Go for the for gold at the cooler. I actually have got a question about that um, for okay. you, Jackie, but we'll um, we'll save that for Q&A. Um, please send through. Oh, yep. So um, uh, using the network ladder, thinking while mapping the network, talk about your role, not your qualifications. Uh, Dr. Christian uh, Willems, uh, purposeful and courageous, um, have valuable discussion points. Uh, tell me more. Um, change view of organizational politics to positive. Competitors need to feel awkward. Get yourself out there. It's a role, not a title. Effective elevator pitch, brilliant. Um, how to have meaningful elevator pitches, define clear goals, outcomes for developing a network, and be courageous. Some terrific comments there, Jackie. I think there's been some, and we've talked, we talked about it at the outset, but this session is really about driving home those little gold nuggets that they can, people can take away and, and implement straight away. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that feedback, Jackie? And just for anyone who's got questions for Jackie, please start typing some um, questions into the chat box and we'll get onto those in just a minute. Well, I actually am so gratified that everyone just actually got the essence. You know, sometimes people don't see the value of it or don't get the essence of what I'm trying to I uh, get across when we talk about that elevator pitch being designed the way that it is. And so I'm just so gratified that it's been meaningful and it's been it's been helpful and everyone's just on it and they've got really specific things they can take away. So thank you. 
very, very rewarding to know that it actually had impact and you can do something useful with it. Yeah, I think, you know, clearly, Jackie, um, the feedback coming out of it is that effective elevator pitch is, is and, and being courageous. Yep. Taking that. Um, I've got a question for you around, um, you know, I went to a session, I think it was yesterday, and I asked, uh, in the in a virtual world, you know, how do we, how do we, you know, sort of build that relationship? Um, and they said, oh, you've got to know your people. Yeah. You've got to, you know, particularly in a virtual world, you, you've got to have that a little bit of um, chit chat about, oh, Jackie, how's, you know, your daughter's getting married this weekend, how's, you know, that and all that sort of stuff um, to get to know your people because that builds trust. Yes. But I guess what from your saying is, you know, if you've got the opportunity at the water cooler, it's not to sort of say, how's your kids or how's the wedding looking this weekend? It's, you know, hey, you know, Jackie, here's my, you know, here's here's what I here's what I could do for you. Here's the WIFM factor that, that drives value. How do you sort of juggle that in, in this yeah. world where you want to build trust and relationships with someone yes. and say, oh, geez, that Jackie's a, a lovely person. Um, and I really, you know, appreciate what Jackie does in the business, but also you know, geez, Jackie means business and Jackie can give me something. You know, how yeah. do you balance that? Yeah, yeah. So that's actually a really, really good point. I think you don't want to become known for the person that is only interested in talking about outcomes and what we need to be doing from a business perspective. And particularly because so many of us are working remotely. I do think you have to have that reputation where I do make a tremendous effort to ask people about things regarding their personal life. So if I had to keep it really simple, let's say out of every eight interactions that I have with Sam, I make sure that five of them are about him and his work and his family and how he's traveling. And three of them are very specific around what I can do and what I need him to do for me. So that overall, it's, the, you know, it's slightly skewed to let's create a relationship of trust. And then there's still definitely that element of we're actually employed to do a job. And this is what I can do for you. What can you do for me? So keeping that ratio of five versus three going. Yeah, that's a that's a really good piece of advice, um, Jackie. And that and it sort of feeds into um, a comment or a question here about that water cooler piece in in that virtual setting. Is is when do you pick your time in a virtual setting? If you're you know perhaps land in a meeting with you know someone that you have wanted to connect with, where do you pick that time? Because you and I know you talk you you do a lot of communication stuff for the <laughs> institute. A lot of our short courses on communication mm. skills. And you're a real expert in that in that space. Um, and you talk about body language, mm. you know, a lot, you know, about how we communicate with body language and the challenges of virtual mm. not being able to see so much of that body language. So how do you find that where that water cooler mm. moment in that virtual setting, perhaps mm. where you can't share the body language? Well, a couple of things. So number one, people that have done anything virtual with me will know that I'm a tyrant and a dictator. I absolutely insist on cameras being on. And I actually send that out in the communication beforehand that you need to have a webcam and it needs to be on. And if, if, if not, it's like me putting a cardboard box over my head and you trying to talk to me with a cardboard box. And I say the WIFM, go back to WIFM. I cannot tell if you're confused. I cannot tell if you're bored. I cannot tell if you're overwhelmed. I cannot tell if you're trying to get a word in. But if your camera's on, I can. I can actually engage with you because of your nonverbals. But coming back to the water cooler, I know a number of clients that actually start a meeting and say, right, the first five minutes is water cooler conversation. So some of the things I do is I say, on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling and why? So if you are um, just super awesome, it's a 10. If you're just super crap, it's a one. What, what number are you on that continuum and why? And then sometimes they'll say, put an emoji up of what makes what emotion you're feeling right now and why. So giving people permission just to have the general chit chat, but then steering more towards the business side of things. I actually tell people, look at the agenda very carefully. Look at the topics. See an opportunity to share your gold nugget. Go away and do some research on that topic and have your gold nugget ready to go. Because specifically in the DISC profile, if you're an S or a C, or as I call them, a Dovin or an L, you can't think immediately, oh, he has an opportunity to sell my gold nugget. So you have to pre-plan what's on the agenda, what are the topics, go research something really hot 
that is an opportunity for you to go, hey, Sam, you know what? On that topic, I've just researched X, Y, Z. I've just discovered. I've got a piece of information that I'd love to share with you. And you might even just type it in a personal chat to Sam. Hey, we've been talking about X, Y, Z. I've done some research on that. Really would like to share it with you. Yeah, really good, Jackie. Really, really good and great advice. And um, I can see that someone's just written, um, you know, great advice um, and uh, particularly around um, picking that right time, picking mm -hmm. that right time and finding that balance um, to do it. And it probably feeds into one of the questions here, which is, is it appropriate to use that gold nugget on your first interaction? I mean, I think you've answered that is to find yeah. that right time. If it is, a, if it is appropriate, you've got one shot at it, perhaps give it a, a go, but you know, otherwise it's, 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 it's the five on, it's the three, the five yeah. to three, so to speak. Yeah. Like if, if you know, coming across Richard Branson is going to be a once in a lifetime opportunity, you go for that gold nugget because even and if did you go for it, it? <laughs> and did you go for it? Um, no, I didn't. And I beat myself up for it. We actually even went to the pub and had drinks and we talked rubbish. We just talked absolute rubbish. And there was just such a golden opportunity. So if, if that's your one and only, go for it. But if this is someone you're going to be working with over a period of time, build the trust, build the relationship, and then start going with the gold nuggets. Fantastic, Jackie. And just one last one about the strength of the network, um, where we need a bridging type or where we need a bonding type on the three categories of networking? I'm, I'm just going to ask for some clarification around that. So I'm assuming putting words into the person's mouth, bonding would be about building collegial relationships uh, within your team potentially or uh, that particular division of the organisation. And bridging would be, say, connecting, say, you're in marketing, knowing that you need to connect with people in operations, you need to connect with people in sales. Is, is, that, is that correct? Whoever put that question, am, am I on the money? Just say yes or no. I'm not sure if Raj is, he's, uh, that's Raj's question there, if he's still on. Okay. Just to clarify. So I, I think it's a really good question to, to, to clarify. I always go that great external customer experiences are the result of great internal customer service, which means the bridging, that every single person, every team in an organization is ultimately there to meet or exceed the needs of a customer. So I have to make sure, have I got connections in marketing? Have I got connections in IT? Have I got connections in AR? Uh, have I got connections in, in finance? Because I'm going to need every one of those departments to make sure my customer has a great experience. So that would be the bridging, but then the bonding would also be, you know, having that sense of camaraderie. Yeah, and Raj has confirmed that's exactly what he was okay. after. So thank you so much, Jackie, for clarifying that. Uh, look, wonderful session. I think all of the feedback here coming through the chat box, great session. Really positive, Jackie. A lot of gold nuggets, um, so to speak, to take away um, and for people to, to implement uh, back into their workplace. I, I would like to say on behalf of the Institute, Jackie, thank you so much for giving up your time today um, to talk to us in our third session of our development day on the positive politics in the workplace. Thank, thank you, Sam. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful to get such uh, engagement and, and uh yeah, as I say, so affirming to know that it's been useful and you can take away and implement it straight away. Thank you, Sam. Thanks so much, Jackie. And that's what the Institute's all about, is providing really, really practical uh, takeaways. We're purpose-led and outcomes-focused on all of our training um, through all of our short courses and leadership programs. And the purpose why we run our development days is twofold. One, to give our professional members and our learners and our people doing our programs and our short courses an opportunity to hone and develop skills really quickly and easily um, and to reaffirm that learning as managers and leaders. And number two is to also connect with the thousands of organisations out there that work with us every day to develop their own managers and leaders um, through our leadership programs and through our facilitators like Jackie Perkins. Um, so it's wonderful to be able to have shared such a great opportunity, such three fantastic sessions with you all today. I really appreciate your attendance. We had, as I said, over 1,500 uh, registrations across the three sessions. 
which was just extraordinary. And clearly the topic of managing up and across has really resonated for both our professional members to develop their skills and also our corporate members and organizations that are working with us uh, to develop their managers and leaders every year, every day to make them more effective um, in their workforce. So thank you so much. Thank you to our three facilitators, Jill Noble, Nick Mills, and Jackie Perkins, three top sessions. We've really set the bar high um, on this first development day of 20, uh, first development day for 2023. Um, and we're going to do uh, one every quarter this year. So you can look forward to more content coming from the Institute and please keep an eye out for that. So thank you very much. I'd also like to thank uh, Libby, um, who is a thank wonderful you, help. Yeah, we know Libby in the background does all of this. We, Jackie and I wouldn't be here today if Libby hadn't <laughs> organised us to be here and do all this. Um, that's our internal network, Sam. That's exactly right. <laughs> Libby will be listening right now. Thank you, Libby. Um, and uh, Scott Martin, Anna Pohl, um, and the whole delivery product and sales team um, who get behind this and bring so many of our members and so many of our organisations that we work with um, here today to, to listen to these fantastic sessions and to develop their skills. So we really appreciate the help um, of everyone at the Institute to put this on. Um, and once again, lastly, thank you to everyone who's joined us today. It's been three top sessions. Um, we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, everybody.